The claim is that the first thing Eichmann did when he came into most of these places was establish what he called Jewish councils. They often wouldn't exist before he got there. And um, found Jews who would then help make up lists of Jews in the community and help organize the Jews so that they could be deported. Now, is that... Now, in some places, the Jewish council resisted. In some places, they resigned. In a couple of places, they committed suicide. But this is what Eichmann's modus operandi, and it allowed him to use Jewish labor to accomplish many of his tasks. Oh, but that's such an extreme example of looking at this war. I'm not, Jews were, no I, one's saying that that's the key to the war. No, no but to, to say, say that Jewish, Jewish councils were saying, no, Jews, Jewish councils were in occupied countries, except for places where the governments or the monarchies were protecting the Jews or their own populations anyway. In hostile, hostile environments where the populations themselves, forget the Nazis, the populations were, themselves were not going to protect the Jews. I mean, otherwise we would have had righteous Gentiles all over Europe. That wasn't happening. I mean, how many barns and attics were, were there hiding Jews? Not very many. So you have populations. So you have, you have a situation where pretty much you can call every council had a gun to its head. Of course. No one and, disputes and, that. Well, the idea, the language I will tell you this, the language in this, I had to say, it took, I hadn't read Hannah Arendt in a long time in, in, in this book, and I, I was it, it, it really, I, I was physically ill reading it, physically ill. I mean, when you hear a line like this, to a Jew, this role of Jewish leaders in the destruction of their own people is undoubtedly the darkest chapter of the whole dark story. Mm -hmm. It had been known before, but has now been exposed for the first time in its, all its pathetic and sordid detail. No. No. Jews were not killing Jews before, before the Nazis came. This is not the darkest chapter in the history of the Holocaust. The darkest chapter in the history of the Holocaust is the extermination of the Jews by the Nazis. The fact that you're talking about Jewish councils and kapos and people who did the best that they could to survive from a woman who wasn't there who talks about Kastner's prominent train and she escaped as part of an elite group before the war because she was able to leave and go to France and then come out and then come back and judge no, you don't get to do that I say you don't get to do that and any survivor who has to feel the mark of Cain on their forehead or the blame or the shame because they were subjected to the kind of evaluation is, is, um, is the darkest chapter. All right. First of all, she was there. She wasn't in there during she wasn't the war. In a, she, was, she was arrested. She was in a detention camp. She, and she escaped. Now, you know, so she was there. Um, obviously, her life was completely ruined and upended by, by, by the Holocaust. So I, you know, I just don't want to, leave, to, 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 to have that. Be... She wasn't in Auschwitz. Thank God. She wasn't. She, she. If was she had, out. if she hadn't. What walked, year was she? What year did she? If she escape? hadn't walked out of the camp in what Gores, all the other escape? people in Gores went to Auschwitz. What year did she escape? Forty, thirty-nine or forty. Yeah. Well, before Poland. Yeah. So well. yeah, so she was not there then, but she was. Well, this was her world. Um, the the line the line you, you you cite, which you know I think is probably the line that is um, the most uh, probably the most off cited line in the book that the darkest chapter in the whole dark story for it. She says as a Jew, right? She's not saying it's the darkest chapter. She's saying as a Jew, it's the darkest chapter. Um, uh, it's 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 for her a claim, right? One that don't not everyone has to agree with, that as a Jew, it's a dark chapter that her fellow Jews in an impossible situation with the gun to their head, um 
made a decision over and over again. You don't make decisions when you have no choices. We always have a choice. If someone puts a gun to your head and says, kill your child, you still have a choice. Listen, when people were in it concentration it, camps, they took food out of their children's mouths to survive. And now, I, and, is that and you know a what? choice? And is that it is a choice. And, and, she, and, and I won't judge them as being criminal or as wrong. Anna and Anna. she doesn't judge she them. She does? She doesn't. Well, you're, you're, I mean, I hate to tell you, but you're wrong. She, she, I have her words. But, read you know, the words. Where does, she, where does she say Why don't that we these hear people from should them? be... What? Why don't we hear from people who I'm are... happy to hear from people, but <laughs> I'm just saying, there's no... She, she never judges them she, in the sense that she says they should be put in jail, they should be killed. She simply says she thinks the darkest chapter is that this happened. So I'm happy to open it up to other people if there are questions. I, I will only say that that's your opinion, well, I'm, as it is my opinion. And there are many people who will go on perhaps either side of ours, but I but will say that anyone the, can have an opinion here. But but you're, you have wait, to back it up with some facts. And some there words. are many people with facts. Well, where are the words that says that she judges? You have to read Hana Yakira. How about you read Hana Arendt? And, and I did, sir. Well, I did. And I'm talking. Listen, she the the contentiousness around Hana Arendt and the words that she used there was not a small thing. It was a huge huge debate and still goes on. So what you say is your interpretation of Aaron, as well as there are other people who have absolutely the opposite. And you know, uh, and it, we could go on forever, okay. but this is not fact on, on either side. This is a sheer interpretation of how we look at, at Jews during the Holocaust and how we do or not do not or do judge them. Whether you think Kastner is a good guy or a bad guy, that's your decision from, from what you glean from this. But in the overall picture, I would say that, you know, that kind of judging is um, a useless exercise. Absolutely useless. Okay. I mean, I'm, yeah. Do you have any idea of uh, when the... Uh, the daughter Zuzi, when she was talking to her father's murderer when they went outside. What they said? Well, maybe not in particular, but did they shake hands when they left, or how, how did that No, go? you know, it wasn't that, um, it, well, no, it wasn't like that, you know. I mean, I think that they had a dialogue, and, um, you know, I didn't know what they said, finally, but it's, uh, you know, some people felt that the end of the, it was funny in America, you know, the one criticism was, was that the meeting didn't end in an embrace <coughs> or a hug. And I said, that's not going to happen in Israel. You know, people weren't going to hug. It's, that's an American thing. Um, <laughs> you know, they wanted something. And so that, the fact that they met at all was, was yeah. amazing. Yeah. You know. Any other questions after hearing this? <laughs> Well, yes, there was a um, statement by the, the assassin yeah. that he wasn't the assassin. Yeah. Well. Uh, was that ever, was anything further done in regard to that? Did, were there ever any commissions of inquiry? Yeah, I to looked into here? it. I did. I, we went into the, 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 the murder trial of the assassin. We found all the, all the archives, of course, in Israel, as normally it was all mislabeled, so we, it took us a year and a half to find them. Um, and we translated everything, including, you know, the autopsy, the ballistics. I, I tried my best to find a possible way that we could explain a switched gun, another, you know, this. It wasn't possible. I mean, in his mind, I think it made him live with it better. Um, was there something else underneath this <coughs> assassination? Uh, absolutely. You know, this little fringe extremist group that half of it was Shin Bet agents, you know, Kastner's bodyguards were removed like three days before. Is that, is that a fact or was that just what he was no. saying? No, they were removed. Supposedly and for budgetary reasons. Um, he, you know, in, in Israel at the time, when Halevi made the judgment against Kastner that he sold the soul to the devil, in Israel at the time there was the law against um, 
Nazi helpers or collaborations. There were many, many trials in Israel, and the Kastner trial was the end of it. People had no more stomach for this any longer. And, um, but to call somebody sold the soul to the devil was a death sentence. So this little group, I mean, uh, one of the screenings I had, the premiere in Los Angeles, the, the, this man stood up and he said, I have, to, I have to make a formal apology. I said, what are you apologizing for? He says, I gave Dan Shemmer driving lessons. <laughs> the getaway driver didn't know how to drive the car. That's how pathetic they were. I mean, so the key for me in this whole thing was that they caught these guys very quickly. They knew exactly where they were. They had been following them for, for weeks, months. And Kastner was a liability. I mean, if you, the documents, the Shoshana Bari finds that the affidavits of these deals that, that Ben Gurion was trying to make, trying to find the money from Becher, they were, the, there were letters going back from the Jewish agency directly to Becher about arms and machinery, looking for Eichmann when nobody was looking for Eichmann because it was a Cold War. This was the time of the reparations when the government almost fell, when, when Ben-Gurion accepted the reparations. So all of this never came out during the trial, and no. it never came out during the appeal. And when did the historian Bari figure this out? Was this while you were making the film? Or no, she figured this out, and it was published in 97, and nobody paid attention. Like Ronald Zweig, the uh, historian, published it. And it was very interesting because people didn't, you know, they kept saying, oh, he was a Jew and he made a promise to Becher and these Nazis. And, and I'm thinking, who promises after the war, after six million people died? And, you know, Kastner was a lawyer. I mean, no offense the lawyers, but, you know, he's going to keep a promise like, like yeah. that, you know? And all these theories about why he gave the affidavit, is it was only Bari who found that, you know, the Jewish agency... The Jewish agency came to the trial. Kastner said, finally, he admitted that he had given the affidavits. And then the Jewish agency came to the trial and denied ever knowing about it. And Kastner tried to give a letter over his own lawyer, Chaim Cohen, directly to the judge, Halevi, which was not done, and Kastner knew that it was not legal to do, saying the Jewish agency was lying and Halevi wouldn't entertain the letter. Now we also find out, since the film came out, that the head of the Shin Bet at the time, Amos Manor, had a meeting with the lawyers before the trial, saying that if the affidavits came up, to deny. So, Kastner was... Yeah, he was... The whole, the whole government was, was, was involved. Scapegoat. <laughs> yeah. I was struck a little bit by the assertion of the assassin that he had an old, rusty gun. <laughs> Is there, what do you make of that? I mean, if he was acting on behalf or with the cooperation of the Shin Bet, why would he have an old, why would anyone go to kill somebody with an old rusty gun? In the very beginning of the film, you, you kind of get the sense, or I got the sense, that this, when you call somebody an assassin, it means that, maybe I've read too many spy novels, but that this is someone who did this for a living, or was an agent or something, or was he just one no, I think, of a you bunch know, of individuals with no experience? Who no could, experience. Okay. So. None at all. You know, I mean, that's what was so amazing about it is that. So this was this. It, I'm one thing I learned about this, it is this was an independent action or not. He had fought in the war, though, right? He had fought, he in, fought the, in the in the Sinai War, but you know, one of the things I learned that was really fascinating is in that time in, in Israel, people didn't have guns. They didn't carry guns. They didn't own guns. It was like bizarre. But so he got, they found this rusty old gun for him. To me, you know, Eckstein is fascinating in that he's very aware of how he was used in, in this chess game. But basically, you know, it's like a young guy who wants to be somebody. He was a nobody. He, he, he came from this salt of the earth family in Jerusalem. His, father, his brother was a captain in the army. And he was a nobody. 
So first he goes running after, you know, wanting to enlist with this Shin Bet and spy on this group, and they sort of said, yeah, come on, you know, we'll, we'll, they threw him in there, and, and he had no direction, he was not really employed, but he could feel important, and then of course he got turned, and he felt like they, they you know, they talked to him, you know, he says that they gave him importance, and to me in many ways, you know, I mean, it's like any anybody putting a suicide vest on, or, or bombing, or they're always young people. They're always young people, and they're all led by the pedagogue, people who have the rhetoric, who have, and they're the ones that are going to be, you know, I think about the Boston bombers, you know. Sure. You know, they, and here was Kastner anyway, who was already a collaborator in, in the eyes, so what was the difference? But they had a long list. They were ready to kill after Kim. They were killing Charette, and they were, <laughs> they were tanks were going in the streets, so, you know, they had a, a big theory of, but this rusty gun was pathetic. It's pathetic. They would send him out to do this job with a rusty gun. It was strange. Yeah, I I'm mean. I'm curious what, what motivated you to make the film. <laughs> so I could have this dialogue with <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, um, I mean, if, if the history was so obscure to people, what happened that, said, that you said, Wow, I'm really willing to devote a couple of years to this question. Uh, it was like eight years. Eight, okay, yeah, eight, eight years, years to this question. Um, because it bothered me. You know, when I first started to talk about Kostner, I remember having a dinner, and I think it was the then head of the Museum of Jewish Heritage was there, and a few other people, and they said, Galen, what are you doing? And I said, well, I think I'm going to do Kostner. And they went, oh. Go find a nice Holocaust film. You know, go find something. This is like, you don't want to do that. And then I was going to say, okay, well, I'll just do the Hungarian part. And, uh, and then I realized that's, if I just told the Hungarian story, nobody would, they would say, okay, maybe he told, maybe he didn't tell, but he still saved people, so okay, let's go home. But that's not why there was a trial, and that's not why he was assassinated. What happened was, to Kassin, happened in Israel. And that became the Israeli story of the right wing and, and, and the left wing, which still sits there today, this, this divide. Of, I mean, I didn't understand either at the time the hatred at the beginning of Israel between these two groups, that Ben-Gurion had this I mean, it wasn't a democracy. It was one man, one party, and that was the ruling party of Israel. And everybody else was marginalized. What was the left? I mean, you know, you talk about the right. I mean, Ben Gurion was the Yavatinsky wing largely, but where was the that left? That was the left. That was Labor Mapai. Ben Gurion was Yeshuvan Mapai, and the Harut was the right wing. So. The, the, and then there was the very, there were some communists over there. Right. And, and Uri Avneri, who was like the strangest one, because Avneri started out being extreme right, lost a brother in the War of Independence, and didn't like the way Ben-Gurion was removing Arabs from the villages. So he became the extreme left, and Tamir was the extreme right. So that this strange bedfellow of bringing down Ben Gurion was was the, the the effort between the two of them, but it was really I mean if you were part of the right wing you couldn't get a job, you couldn't your children couldn't go to the same schools it was, a, and 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 oftentimes you came out out of prison, you came from out of prison in North Africa where your the Jewish agency betrayed you and the British sent you. So they came, that was their heritage from them. Anyway, I thought it was a great story. Yeah. <laughs> this. Although I, you know, you, did, you had no inkling about the, the Ben-Gurion involvement when you began this. No. I mean, which clearly made the film, uh, the, uh, I mean, no. gave it a huge amount of its success. I mean, without that, 
aspect, right? I mean, it would have. I had no, and I didn't even want to go there. It was like, I was like, how am I going to explain Israeli politics? I couldn't understand Israeli politics. I was funny because I had this cam young cameraman when I first started filming, and his <laughs> father was, was um, uh, the best, um, he was from the right, very extreme right wing, and his mother was Meretz, very well. And he would come home and he would talk about what he was doing that day filming and then his parents ended up every night in an argument. <laughs> so he said, I'm not, I can't talk about this anymore because I can't stand my parents screaming at each other because it was all still like there, you know. Well, great. Um, we have some food out. Oh, oh one more, question. another question. <laughs> One aspect of this that particularly interests me, and there are so many aspects of it, we could discuss it for weeks after weeks, is why after seven years a judiciary that condemned these people to life imprisonment yeah. let them go after seven years. What, what changed so much uh, in that period that uh, this happened? Yeah. Ben Gurion by that time had had left office and and was living in the Negev in the kibbutz and he um, had a very good friend who was from the right wing Cohen and I think the idea was this was a way of an industrial peace a way to bridge these two factions let these guys go that. The right wing wanted them out of jail. They were young kids. Well, Menkes wasn't, but the other two were. Um, and this was some sort of peace that they were going to make um, with the right wing. To, because Kastner by that time, you know, nobody even wanted to talk about Kastner. Certainly in the Eichmann trial, they didn't want to bring up Kastner and, and, and what the yeshiv did do or didn't do. They wanted it to go away. They wanted to make a new country and then try to forge this between these two groups. And, um, you know, it was sort of a joke that they asked Shuji's mother the pardon. You know, she knew very well, Shuji, that they were going to pardon them no matter what. I think um, I was going to say something about the, um, oh, it's funny, you know, talk about how small Israel is and the incestuousness of it. Dan Shemer, when he was in jail, um, Givati, the, the, the warden, had a, had a very um, advanced program for, you know, rehabilitation, was doing all sorts of things. So they had drama in, in, in the jail, for, and Dan Shemer loved it, and he ended up... <laughs> He ended up becoming the theater manager, stage manager for, for Israel's, one of Israel's most important theaters, the Camry Theater. <laughs> and the Israeli playwright in the 90s uh, did a play about Kostner that became very famous and they did it at the Camry Theater and they had a big problem. They had to change the stage manager because they couldn't have the stage manager as one of the assassins of Kostner. So it was like, yeah. <laughs> And actually, he learned English and French. He learned English in prison, speaks fluent French. This play, what was its perspective? <laughs> hmm? The play that you just talked about. It's it basically, it was the did it, trial. Did it exonerate him in the uh, play? No, I think it was really, it, it didn't exon, it, it, well, it was about the trial and the factions. And there's a wonderful film that it turned into a film. Um, it's, it's got it's English subtitles that you can, I, I don't know if you can get it. It's an interesting film, um, wonderfully acted. Uh, essentially, it's much more about the trial. It's all focused about the trial. I mean, Kastner, you know, he was exonerated. The, you know, the, the appeal happened, but of course people didn't pay any attention. Well, that does seem a bit, I mean, it seems, at least when I watched the film, I know nothing about it except that, a bit staged in the sense that if he really had worked with the Jewish agency and with Ben Gurion, it seems like, well, he's dead. Let's, no one's yeah, paying possibly. attention. Let's exonerate him. I mean, it seemed possibly. like, uh, I mean, 
I mean, the judges would disagree with that, but it's very possible. Yeah. No, it's possible. I don't know. There was one judge who held out. I mean, he never was exonerated on the perjury charge right. of lying about the affidavits. That, that, and there was one judge who, who abstained from that. I mean, one of the interesting things I didn't know is that, because I had known about the Kastner trial, but not intimately, is that the judge, Halavi, was then one of the three judges in the Eichmann trial, yeah. which I found quite interesting and and pregnant because so much of the idea, I mean, of yeah. Jewish cooperation was brought into the Eichmann trial. And, I mean, Arendt, you know, what Arendt says is the reason I'm talking about this is because it was in the trial, not, right. you know, and the fact that Halavi had been the, tri the yeah. presided over Kastner helps, I think, maybe explain why, why they allowed so much of that testimony into the yeah, I don't really know exactly, you know, I know there was one thing that Hansi Braun said that was interesting in a in a interview where she said it was personally it was never published before, but she said that she was told not to talk about how she rescued. It was like I mean they were it was by Hausner I, or who? Yeah, yeah, by Hausner. It was complicated the trial. The other interesting thing was Gabriel Bach, who was one of the prosecutors, wrote the appeal for Kastner. He was a young lawyer at the time, and he wrote the appeal, um, and he's very proud of it. So um, you have that on the on the DVD. Oh, yeah, I haven't watched the on supplemental the one. If you get, <laughs> yeah. you can get this film That's right. <laughs> on Amazon, and there's three hours extra of all the survivors talking about the train, about Bergen Belsen, about Gabriel Bach, um, who's 90, is amazing, talking about the appeal and the time of the trial, which is, um, it's, 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 a, it's really incredible to have it. Right. Are there any last questions, or should we? Repeat? Thank you. Thank Just you. a very quick Thank one. You. What do you plan to do next? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> a good answer. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Thank you. Thank you.